Good morning, good morning. Once again, it's time for the Sunday School Hour at my office, Missionary Baptist Church. We're here every morning from 9 a.m. to 9.45 a.m. You are welcome to come out and, you know, we're going through some changes now, but God is still good. We welcome you to the sanctuary and to those on social media. We once again, we thank you also for coming out. We're still considering our studies uh, for this, uh, through the, for the Holy Spirit. Uh, we've gone through several lessons, and if you join in us and you haven't been here for it, don't worry about it. it. Each lesson is a lesson. Now, so we're getting ready to commence in that. Once again, we also have our morning worship experience starts at 10 uh, a.m. this morning. We ask that we welcome you to come out, and you still have time to make it to Sunday school and to make it to the morning worship experience. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to my, uh, if we have a word of prayer, I'm going to turn it over to my uh, brother in the ministry, Minister McGee. Let us bow our heads. Dear Father, come in the name of your Son, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for this time of study, Father, of your word, Father. We pray something is said or mentioned, Father, that will help those who are listening, Father, who want to study the word more. So we pray that you pay for anointing on the teachers this morning and all those who are listening, Father. So we praise you, give you honor and glory forever. Amen. 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 Good morning. Good morning to everyone. Our lesson today, the ministries, once again, the ministries of the Holy Spirit. It says we all want to change in our lives. We all want change. We must realize there is no change without the Holy Spirit. As much as we want change, we have to realize there is absolutely no way of changing the way God wants us to change without the Holy Spirit. And if it was, many would have uh, not told the disciples to stay and tarry until the Holy Spirit had come upon him. We're reading today out of John, the 16th chapter, uh, verses 7 through 14. It reads, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that you go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and he see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it unto you. The Holy Spirit, number one, the Holy Spirit saves. John 3 and 5. Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and of spirit, he cannot, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Why is that, Mr. Norman, when it says here in John 3 and 5, unless one is born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. In that, in that scripture is letting us know. When he said to be born again, it, the, the reason that is that you have to, uh, what did he say, born, start a new, a whole new life. To be born again is to start a whole new life from the beginning. And it says that you must be born of water, of a baptism, as, as John baptized Jesus, and of the Spirit. You must be able to have those enter into your life. You can't just say you're going to be physically born again. It must be a spiritual reborn. As, as we said, when Nicodemus went to Jesus and tell, he told him, you have to be 
born again. He was not talking about a physical rebirth. He's talking about spiritual, born of the water of the spirit. We know once we're baptized and we also uh, born through the water, but it's not the water saves us, but the, the spirit that saves us. It's a, it's a, it's a saying. It says you got to have that rebirth, that spiritual rebirth that's going to change your life. You're going to start a whole new life. The past life that you had is everything that's going to start changing. Just as when you were born physically, you grew. So now in the spiritual rebirth, it is time for you to start growing. And to do that, you need the birth. You need that rebirth with the water and the Holy Spirit. John 16 and 8. And when he comes, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. He will convict of sin. What is that saying, Mr. Norman? And when he said he will convict, what he's talking about, it will make you aware of the sin in your life. The world, the world, you know, we're talking about the world. He will convict the world of all that's going wrong, but on an individual basis, he will, the Holy Spirit will convict you. He will convict you through the Spirit of what you are doing wrong. And he will also convict you of what is right and what is the judgment. He's, this, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. When Jesus left here, he read the priors that he missed. When Jesus left here, he knew that they would still have questions and he would not going to be there physically with the disciples or his followers to answer the question. So he was in the Holy Spirit, and he's telling them what the Holy Spirit will be capable of when he comes. And right there we read, he will convict the world. He would point out to the world the sin of what they're doing. He will also point out to them what is righteousness and of judgment. Those questions that they have, the Holy Spirit will provide the answers concerning those subjects. Amen. It also says, how, like Minister Norman said, how does he convict? Number eight, our world convicts us by our moral standard, by his presence, and by his power. He convicts us of our need of a Savior. If we are going to come to Jesus, we must believe not only that we are a sinner in need of a Savior, but also that we are, that we are failures in a need of forgiveness. Not only will the Holy Spirit convict us of what is wrong, but he will also convince us of what is right. Why does the Holy Spirit have have to convince us of what is right, it stands to reason that if we don't truly understand what is wrong, our sin problem, apart from the Holy Spirit, then we cannot understand what it means to be right apart from the Holy Spirit. See, he can he converts or changes a man. Everyone wants to change in some way. Or another, whether it is an addiction problem, a chronic rage issue, or character flaw that is running your most significant relationship, there are areas in our lives where we want to change but struggle to do so. And more than this, the Bible the Bible makes it clear. The Bible makes clear we must change from sinful to holy if we hope to have a true relationship with God. So how can we do this? Certainly, we can't do this on our own power. True change comes only through the power of the gospel of grace. And to be altered specific when it comes to actually changing real tangible things in our lives, the Bible makes it clear that the Holy Spirit can change us. The Father appointed what he wants done. The Son accomplishes the work of the Father. And the Holy Spirit applies the work of the Son to people. But what specifically does the Holy Spirit change in us? Why should we seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit throughout our whole life? 
Here are seven ways the Holy Spirit changes us. Number one, the Holy Spirit changes us through regeneration and makes us and, and marks us for God. Titus 3, 4, and 5. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appears, he saves us not because of works done by our righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom we whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become tires according to the hope of eternal life. Once again, back to one, and I'm going to ask Minister Norman to touch on this. The Holy Spirit changes us through regeneration. We must understand as we look at the word regeneration, regeneration means to bring back, to make come alive again. It regeneration. So we were dead because of sin, but through the Holy Spirit changes us through the rhythm. Regeneration brings us back to life, but not to the same life that we had before, but to a new life. You know, we go to plant gardens or something like that. You, you can put a bulb in the ground, the flower comes up, it's beautiful, all that, then it will die down, but the bulb is still there. When the season changes, it regenerates itself so that a new flower will come up. And so what it's saying that even though that bulb is buried in the ground, there's still life, but it's not the same life, it's a dormant life, but an unproductive life. But when the, when the season comes, when the spring comes, and it's watered and given uh, uh, fertilizer, that flower will come up out of that bulb that's regenerated into a new, beautiful flower. So this is what the, this Holy Spirit gives us. It regenerates us. Not only does it regenerate us, it changes us to something that we didn't have before. It changes it. It marks us. For God, marks mean that we don't have we don't have no certain tattoo or nothing like that. But our whole life is changing. It marks us for God. We are sealed. We are one of His now, and so everything about our life is going to be different. That's what the regeneration is talking about. Your whole new life is you about to come. And some people say, well, when I was saved, that was my new birthday because my new life had started. And so that's what regeneration is talking about. Amen. Number two, the Holy Spirit changes us, and I love this, by bringing us intimacy with God. Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches, of his glory, he might grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints. What is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Minister Norman. Amen. The, 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 the key word here in this, in this verse and this what we explain is intimacy. Intimacy. And, and, and if you look at that S means a close relationship. It means a, a relationship so close that it's beyond any other and that you have knowledge. It's like a husband and wife, mother and child. You have that intimacy of having been interacting with one another. You know, they have tell stories about how you've been married so long that you can finish each other's sentences or you start to look alike. You have an intimate relationship and what the Holy Spirit does it transfers us and, and helps us to get into that intimacy with God. It, 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 the Holy Spirit gets in us and we want to communicate 
with the Lord. We want to do things. We want to study His Word. So the Holy Spirit helps us to gain that intimacy with God. But we have a desire. It gives us a desire to, to, to speak to God, to pray to God, to research and study God's Word. That's how we develop the intimacy with God. And I'm not trying to say, but sometimes it's not just to get that intimacy. It's not just talking about coming to church on Sunday or doing something. Intimacy means 24 7 relationship with someone that you have gained such a knowledge of that you feel like they took their part of As I said, talk about husband and wife finishing each other's sentences. They've been together so long and know each other so well that they know their thoughts, they know what they're going to say before they say it. And that's what God, that's the intimacy we need with God. God knows our thoughts, but we need to know and have that intimate relationship that we know what God expects of us. If you, you have to come to Reverend Long Street. What, what, what does God want with me? If you have that intimacy with God, you don't have to go through me. You can talk, speak to the Lord yourself, and he will tell you what he expects of you. If you have that close relationship with him, that was the whole point of the veil being torn down in the temple. No need of a high priest anymore, because now if you have that intimacy with God through his son Jesus, that you can go straight to him and be able to communicate with him, talk to him without some in between, because now you have Jesus. He's the one that takes care of that for you. So you need to have that, that Holy Spirit help you with that intimacy. And, and this is what we're striving for as Christians in this new life. And, and don't ever say, well, Reverend, I, I, I think I've got that now. I, I, I think I, no, you don't have it now. Intimacy is an ongoing thing. You keep working at it. You keep working on it. Amen. Uh, uh, you, you, you keep keep thinking about that. You keep working on it. Keep praying. You keep studying. You, you keep on because you not you don't want to just settle for a part time relationship or just a, just enough to get me by. You want to have that intimate relationship with God so that when you go through something, you don't have to be worried or talking to other people about it. You have a relationship through the Holy Spirit that you can act straight of God what you need to do. Amen? It was, um, and I think I, you know, until the day I leave here, I'll be talking about this one scripture uh, that means so much to me in Philippians, the third chapter. Because Paul was just so adamant, and I, and I knew the reason why it means so much to me, because I look at his upbringing, and I look at uh, the knowledge that he had. This was a Intelligent, intelligent man. I mean, you're talking about someone that was really smart. He was highly educated. He was so educated that he told the other folks, he told them, he said, first of all, I want you to know that I don't mean to brag, but I'm more intelligent than you are. And so then he said, uh, let me explain something about myself. And he talked about his upbringing and everything. Keeping of the law, he said he was blameless. Uh, he was a Pharisee, uh, uh, and all of that. And then he said, but when it came to one thing, he said, but all these things back here that I have gained, he said, I now count as gone, as rubbish, as nothing. He counted all of this knowledge that he had that he gained over the years. He said, I now count this as rubbish. For one thing, to have an intimate relationship with him, to know him and the power that's in his resurrection. And that's what Minister Norman was saying, that when we have that, when we go from knowing about him to knowing him, then it no longer takes me going to you and saying that, you know, that you've done wrong. Or you come to me, Sister Day, and saying, Brother Bobby, you know that that wasn't right. Before you get to me, when you tell me that wasn't right, the Holy Spirit, because of my relationship, is already convicted in my heart. 
and I can receive what you're telling me. And I can receive it because of my relationship with him. And that's why Paul was so adamant when he said, I want to just know him, not the matter, but to know him and the power that's in his resurrection. What is he resurrecting us from? He's resurrecting us from our old behaviors to something new, to bringing us into this place. Just like, I think, who was it? Enoch. They said Enoch walked so close with God and he was no more. God had to take him. And there's a place we can move into God to where we walk so close with him to where the least little thing that we do to offend someone, it can automatically convince our heart. And it causes us to, in the beauty in it, it causes us to have the most powerful attribute there is, and that is love, because we can have all the other gifts, we can preach well, we can teach well, uh, uh, we can go and give our money, and we can do all these other things, but if we don't have love, because that holds everything we got, yes. everything else will eventually it will collapse. That's why you see big ministries or things in people's lives, they're having success and stuff, and all of a sudden, you're like, well, how could this happen to them? And it collapsed because love holds everything together because what is God? God is love. First John 4, 7, and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. But he that loveth not, knoweth not God, because God is love. So we can't have an intimate relationship with him and not start developing those attributes. And that's what faith is. It's just a trust. And when we build a relationship with him, then we start automatically developing that mm -hmm. type of yes. changes us. Amen. Number three, uh, it says the Holy Spirit changes us by continuously, I love it, continuously sanctifying us and giving us the ability to produce good. 2 Corinthians 3.18 And we with all, and we all, we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. But this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So I can say, this big light of mine, <laughs> Minister Nelson. Amen. As we, first of all, as we go through this quick little review, this one to say the Holy Spirit changes by continuing sanctifying us. I want to make it clear right now, sanctifying sanctify is not a denomination. I know when I was young, we people say, I'm going to, we're going to the sanctified church for today. Every church of God should be sanctified. It, 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 it's, not, it's not a denomination. It's a process. And we just read it continues sanctifying us. In other words, this process don't stop until the Lord takes you away from here. You are being sanctified on a, on a continuous basis. And, and, and we said, the scripture said, when we are with, with unveiled face, back in the days, the Jewish women had veils over their face. This is what this said, with unveiled face, what Paul is talking about, there's nothing in front of you to keep you from seeing what you need to see. And notice that there's no, it, said, it says, you got a clear vision. And it says, beholding the glory of God. The Lord. So, so that, that that veil that they used before, he said, when an unveiled face, you have a clear view, clear sight of the glory of the Lord and what you are striving to be and being transformed. And this, this sanctification, it, like I say, is a process. You are going through it. Wake up, you're being sanctified. Come to church, you're being sanctified. Study, you're being sanctified. And even in your sleep, God is sanctifying you. Your dreams change. You're thinking about doing good and, 
in God, you being sent to God provides gifts for you. And let me tell you this, a gift is a gift. It's not somebody charge you for it. God has a gift for you. He's going to give you that gift. The Holy Spirit will provide that gift for you. So don't be going out and pay somebody to teach you how to speak in tongues or how to heal people and all this other stuff. Those are gifts the Holy Spirit gives. And so if God's got a gift for you, he's going to give it to you without any charge, all right? And so, and so we have, he's talking about, we were talking about regeneration. Sanctifying is the process of that regeneration. And it's what we do. Sanctification is what we're going through. And I just said earlier, you are going to continue going. It is not something, well, okay, uh, you've had three months of sanctification, you through, you graduate. That's not what it's about. Sanctification is something going on. I don't care if you're 10 to 110. You're still being sanctified. You're still going through sanctification. And the Holy Spirit, the same process is helping us, it says, to produce good for God. What do you mean? We are God's representative. Through the Holy Spirit and through sanctification, we are able to produce good for God. Well, why good for God? Because we produce good for God. People see us, and through us, they see God. That's why we got to produce good for God. Because I don't care what you do, some folks are never going to get into this church building, but they see you. And through the good that you produce for God, they see God. And so that's what that is all about. Amen. Amen. Yes. And as it's the Holy Spirit sanctifies, as it's setting us apart, number four says, now the Holy Spirit changes us by giving us the power to resist. And if you think about it, the Holy Spirit, we're, we're understanding what it is. It's giving us an understanding of what we really have within us. Because if the Holy Spirit lives within us, then we already have what we need to overcome but we just have to learn how to use what God, we have to learn how to use the tools God has made available in order for us to be able to resist when those temptations come. Because we can't resist without being able to know how to use something. If you want to take, uh, if you have a flat tire, if you've never changed it and you don't know how to use the tools, you're going to sit there and let someone come and help you to change that tire. But it would be, it would make things, depending on where you're at, a lot easier if you knew and you had the tools right there instead of having to wait an hour or two for someone. If you could do it yourself right then. So a lot of times, we're depending on someone to come when we get in situations and to help us and to guide us out of it. But as God is sanctifying and setting us apart, as he's setting us apart, then what we're realizing, we're starting to realize because of our relationship, the power that we really have. We have the power to speak. Like he says, I've given you the ability to speak life, death, blessings, or curse. He said, but you choose for yourself. We have to choose. We have, because the first thing I said it last week, the first thing God gave Adam in the garden, and the, first of all, the first thing God did when the earth was void was God spoke. He created something out of nothing. And then he gave man. He put Adam in the garden. He didn't just put him in the garden and he wasn't able to do anything, Adam had the ability to create. He, he, he get, God gave him that, and that's been passed on to us through now through the Holy Spirit, but a lot of times while we walk in areas, in our, while we continue to walk in areas of defeat is because we really don't know what we have. Because there's no connection. There's no relationship. So in 2 Timothy 2 and 2 Timothy 
the second chapter, for God, for God, uh, for God gave us not a spirit of, of not a spirit, spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but sometimes we walk in fear because we don't understand what we have. If he hasn't given us that, then he's given us a spirit to overcome fear. Because how do we overcome fear? Because our trust is in what we're dealing with in our circumstances. Our trust is in the God that we know that can help us in the midst of our circumstances, don't care how big they are, because it's nothing too hard for him. And so if you have anything to say on this one right here, the Holy Spirit changes us by giving us the power to resist before I go to number five. Amen. The only thing I'd like to say on that is it just give us the spirit of fear. The fear that we express when we was in our life without God. We feared everything. We worried about everything. But God has let us know we do not have that with him in that relationship. We no longer have the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. He says, after you do a regeneration, you no longer need to have that fear. That, but you have power and love and self-control. And let me be, be honest with you, the power is not you. It's a power that comes through from God through you. That's where the power comes from. And that love, to love everyone, that self-control to keep you in check from what you're doing in your life. Amen. Amen. So we left with asking ourselves when we're in a situation that uh, if God hasn't given us that, then why would we walk in fear? Whatever it is. If he said, I haven't given you the spirit of fear. So we have to ask ourselves, if I'm continuously walking in fear, mm -hmm. then why am I continuously walking in it? God hasn't given it to me. Yes. Because I don't know what I have. Because if I knew what I have, then I would use it. If I knew how to change the tire, I wouldn't wait two hours out in the sun for someone to come and change it. I would just change it myself and go on every way. Number five, the Holy Spirit changes us by opening our eyes to truth. I'm going to read John 16, uh, verses 12 through 15, and Minister Norman is going to touch on this one. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth for he will speak he will not speak he will not speak on his own authority but whatever he hears he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come he will glorify me for he will take what is mine and declare to you all that the father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare to you. Amen. As we see this, as Minister read that Jesus is talking and he's let me know there's more things I would like to teach. There's more information I would like to give, but you cannot bear them now. In other words, he says, uh, there's some things coming up that you cannot handle right now. There's information that I have I'd like to give you, but you can't handle it right now. But he says, I know it's coming up. He says, when the spirit of truth comes, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, he will guide you into all the truth. That's what he's talking about. For he will not speak on his own authority. See, the spirit, the Holy Spirit is not going to come down and say, hey, hey, hey. Everything else that we did is no longer prevalent. You know, whatever we spoke, whatever we read, that's no longer prevalent. No, Jesus said he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you things that are coming. He, he's going to he's, he's, he's come and let you know what's the future hold. Just as you came to me to ask me questions about what is going to happen, the Holy Spirit will be here to do the same for you. And he will glorify me. In other words, the Holy Spirit will not be in conflict, conflict with what I taught you. 
or how I've been instructing you. There, see, we have to understand between the Father, Son, and Spirit, there is no conflict. And he's letting them know just because I'm not here and the Holy Spirit, there will be no conflict. For he will take what is mine, and what, what I've been teaching, what I've been saying, and declare it to you. In other words, they work it together. Sister, we, there's no separation. They, they're all in one. And all that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said he would take what's mine. He said, Jesus, let me know whatever I had intended for you, whatever teaching I've already given you, there's not going to be any conflict when the Spirit comes because he's going to declare unto you what I have been doing all along. See, some, some people might think, well, okay, Jesus, leave the Holy Spirit's going to come. It's going to change everything. No, the Holy Spirit came to continue the ministry that Jesus, Jesus part of the ministry that ended when he returned to his Father. But the ministry still went on through the Holy Spirit, but there was no conflict. It continued on in the same vein that Jesus wanted it to continue. He says, whatever I did, whatever I said, the Holy Spirit will continue. Amen. Amen. And one more thing. I want to go back and read this. Minister Norman just read it. It says, all that the Father has, Jesus said, is mine. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Think about this here. Holy Spirit lives within us. It belongs to us. All that the Father had, Jesus said, is mine. Now, Jesus set that example. He went and fasted 40 days, 40 nights. He came out. He was weak, tired, and very hungry. And now, like we're in situations like that when we're weak and and we're very vulnerable, Satan comes to him. That's when the enemy comes and he speaks. The Bible says the mind is the battlefield. So he's planting a seed. That's where he planted a seed. Because he's talking to Jesus. <coughs> and he says, if I can say it this way, I see you weak, tired, and I know you're hungry. So, and you say you're the son of God, but if you're the son of God, command that these stones turn to bread. Do this right here. He said, Jesus didn't lean on his own understanding. Jesus said, took him to the Torah. He took him to the law. Because the devil knows the word. He knows he has no defense against the word. He said, it's written. Let me take you here. Deuteronomy 8 and 3. Let me take you to Deuteronomy, the 8th chapter, verse, I think it's verse 3. It says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He took him to the scriptures. He didn't use his own word because he says, all that the Father has is mine. All that the Father has is mine. So if it's mine, I'm going to use the one thing that can cause you to flee, that can give me victory, even in the midst of everything that I'm going through right now. He used those tools. We have the Holy Spirit living within us, greater is he that's in us than our circumstances that's in the world. All that the Father, and he said, and then I will declare it unto us. He's declaring it on to us. And it belongs to us because he's giving it to us. And we just have to learn and get to know it right here. And once we do, then when we get in situations, then when we'll find ourselves or start seeing the things we used to say, then it'll start, we'll be saying the things that God wants us to say. Even in difficult situations. Why? Because of that. Now we know him, and now we're drawing closer to him. And so you're no longer waiting for me to talk you into having joy. You're learning how to get joy on your own and use what God has already given you. Number six, the Holy Spirit changes us through, here we go, 
and following our prayer. Romans 8.26, likewise the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what to pray for as we are, but the Spirit intercedes for us with groaning too deep for words. Mr. Norman. Amen.